Welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are covering every company in SP 500, and today is Hormel Foods Corporation, ticker HRL. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, has a market cap of $21.9 billion, enterprise value of $24.6 billion. So you see about $2.5 billion in net debt on this business. Overall, about 10% of the overall enterprise value. Not an unreasonable amount of debt to have. Industry is in the food products industry. So Hormel Food develops, processes, and distributes distributes various meats, nuts, and food products, deferred services, deli, and commercial stores in the U.S. and internationally. Four segments, grocery, refrigerated, Ginny, O, Turkey Store, and international. So it looks like the grocery products include fresh meat, frozen items. Um, do we have some brands? Yeah. So here we got brands. So those are good. Skippy, Spam, Hormel, Natural Choice, Applegate, Justin's, Ginny, O, Cafe H, Herdez, Black Label, Sadler's, Columbus, Gatherings, Herdez, Holy, Columbus, Planters, Nutrition, Planters, Cheese Balls, and Corn Nuts. So what's really interesting about food products, especially if you have branded food products, is you can usually get pretty good margins, pretty good business. It's a repeatable buy. If it's something that you're buying every week, that's something that can be habitual for a family. Habit-formed product purchases are good because what families will do tends to do is not check the prices of their favorite brand. If you buy their brand and that's the brand you buy every week and it's the brand you've bought every week for years and years and years, you won't necessarily notice, hey, the price went up 3% this year. The price went up 7% this year. You're not going to be monitoring the price week to week because every week the price tends to stay the same. And so those little changes in prices over time or even changes through shrinkflation where you shrink the amount of product in the size of the, of the thing, you're not going to necessarily notice those incremental changes. Now, over a 10-year period, you might notice, but that's the power of branding. That's the power of pricing power that you have in these businesses. Something that strikes me as really attractive here is the beta of 0.1865. Why is that important? A low beta here being over 80% lower than the average S&P 500. Average S&P 500 would have a beta of 1. Beta of 0.18 means it's 82% less volatile as a stock. Now, the less volatile the stock is, the less volatile the business tends to be, it means it's relatively high predictability. This is not a thing I use for all the companies I buy, but when you see a low beta like this, it gets me excited, gets me thinking, hmm, what's in this business that makes it so interesting? Now, return on invested capital, we're gonna see even more interesting stuff here. You can instantly see with this chart that they have 20 straight years of profitability. Anytime you have 20 straight years of profitability, it instantly jumps to my top consideration as a high quality business. High quality businesses are profitable each and every year. They have very few times where they're unprofitable and also relatively reliable. You also see very little change from year to year, 16%, 14%, 12%. 13, 13, 13, 13. You see these periods where it's relatively flat, relatively stable. There are changes, but you're not bouncing up and around. You're not seeing cycles. You don't see cycles here, three to five year cycles, seven year cycles, where you're dipping in profitability, going back up. This is a stable business. Now you have had a decline over the last five years here, but overall, for the most part, you're between the 10% and 20% lines. You're almost always earning at least a 10% return on invested capital. Very strong sign for you as a potential shareholder. I like to see 10% return on invested capital, 15% return on equity. We're hitting that hurdle for both of these here. Now, so far we have high quality business. You're seeing the that they're in an industry where you can have pricing power, you do have brands, overall relatively good. So now when we think about valuation, we need to compare the PE ratio and the growth rate. First thing with growth rate, you can see that the return on equity and return on invested capital exceed all of the growth rates we see here. Higher than revenue, higher than asset, higher than free cash flow, higher than EPS. So what that says is we can self-fund all our growth. We don't need any debt. Debt is simply there to help boost our returns if we want it. And we do see that, that the debt is relatively low, 10% type of the enterprise value. Overall, not remarkable, but it could explain some of the difference between why your return on equity is 17% instead of the 16% return on invested capital. Now, revenue growth rate of 4%, Mid single digits, four to six percent, not super impressive. You do see some gap here between the four percent and the six point nine percent EPS growth rate. So what that's telling us is that you're getting some sort of operating leverage, whether that be from running your, you know, growing margins or from buying back stocks. Something in there is giving us a little bit of operating leverage. However, your assets are growing faster than revenue, free cash flow, and EPS. That is a good explanation for why we have a lower return on invested capital today in 2022 at 9.4% versus 2012 at 16%. That decline is because you're growing your assets faster than your revenue, assets faster than your 
earnings. So your overall return on invested capital is going to go down over time because you have more assets today and you're not growing your earnings as fast as you are your assets. Not a great sign for the future. I don't like that deterioration. Hopefully they turn it around. It has occurred in the past and they've managed to turn it around. So overall, not bad there, but our revenue is not growing super, super fast. <laughs> now, thinking of valuation, PE of 23. So we're saying basically your earnings yield is about four and a half. Somewhere in that range, you're growing 4%. You can instantly see a clear way where you could say, okay, maybe I can get 8% returns. If, I'm, if I use my EPS growth rate here of 7%, four and a half, maybe we get 11% returns. You're kind of bouncing in that range of returns between you know 8% and 11%. Now, do they pay a dividend? Let's see. They pay a dollar for share in dividend. They have forty dollars, so your dividend yield is about two and a half percent. If we do two and a half percent plus our revenue growth rate, we say the return might be, you know, six and a half, seven percent. Let's call it seven percent return. If we do it plus our EPS rate, which is probably going to drive what we can use to pay our dividend, you can see about a nine and a half percent return. So on maybe the lower end, we're talking seven and nine and a half percent returns. What's not super great here is because we're in the lower half of our revenue growth rate, that four to six percent range, we're not really seeing the potential to get double digit returns. Part of that is driven by the PE ratio. Part of that is driven simply by you're not in the range of like say eight to 10% revenue growth where you could really see an easy path to double digit returns. So high quality business and it's growing just enough to be a potential viable investment if you like those eight to 10% type returns. But if you're trying to get the double digit 10%, 12%, 15%, this is not so far being attractive. Now you can get there if the valuation gets cheap enough. If your PE is 10, you have an earnings yield of 10%, and then you throw on 4% revenue growth rate, we can clearly see a path to double digit returns and it gets a lot more attractive. That's the nice thing about high quality businesses. You don't necessarily need super high revenue growth in order to justify the purchase, but you do need some either good growth or a good price. You don't necessarily need both. So it's just something to think about that right now, this is probably more in the overvalued range if you want a 10% plus return. If you're willing to get an 8% return, this seems probably like a fair value for the business so far. Now let's look at margins here. So we can see that the margins are jumping around a little bit. 16.1, 16.8, 19.5, 22, 21, 20, 19, 19, 16. So there's not that stability that you like where it's year to year, every year the same. The gross margins are bouncing around. Now, operating margin has gone up a little bit from 9% to 10%, but this has not been a straight line. You have seen some that volatility as well. That volatility makes it a little less predictable as a business. It's why we can see we've gone from basically earning a dollar per share to $1.80 per share, back to $1.80, and so we're only up about, you know, doubling our earnings over the course of a decade, but a little less than that. You know, doubling would be about a 7.2% EPS growth rate. We're at 6.9, so a little bit less. Um, that's still impressive when you think that they've paid a dividend. That's about half their earnings. So the ability to grow at a 7% while paying out half your earnings is still pretty good results, and you can only do that because you have these high returns on equity. So you're getting a nice return for yourself as a shareholder. If you're enjoying this video so far, if you're learning something, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's go to the income statement now. <sighs> So we've already looked a little bit at the gross margin. The, gr the cost of goods sold is not going to help us too much here. One of the things I like to focus on, though, is growth in SGNA. So we've gone from 627 million to 863 million. So quickly, that's like you know 240, maybe a 30 percent, 40 percent growth in your SGNA here. Now. What's nice is that your gross profit has grown faster than your SGNA, so you're going to get some operating leverage there, and you're growing faster as well on the net income line, so you've doubled that. Now, part of that, of course, is you can clearly see the gap here between the tax cuts and tax cuts and jobs act again 2017 you had the income tax 432 million now it dropped down to 169 million 200 million 200 million even though you have a similar profitability that gap is not because you know the profits have gone down that much that gap this big jump here in net income from 847 million to 1 billion is from the change in the corporate tax rate so you're getting some of this boost here the seven percent from a non-repeatable event of the corporate tax rates going down there's always a possibility of corporate tax rates go back up again so i would be really hesitant to rely on a seven percent growth rate going forward it's why i always like to rely first and foremost on revenue growth rates they're more predictable it does look like the shares outstanding have gone up over the course of a decade, 540 million, 550 million. It's not 
even a 10% growth. It's, it's relatively small, something like a 2% growth. It, it's, it's basically the menace. I wouldn't even worry about it. If you don't get more than a 1% per year dilution rate, then it's not really something I'm super concerned about. Balance sheet. Inventory is almost doubled, 950 million to 1.7 billion. PPE has doubled from 900 million to 2.1 billion. So again, let's look at it. So this is kind of in line, but it does show that like, you know, your your PPE is more than doubled by a little bit. Your goodwill has gone up significantly. So they did some acquisitions here of 4 billion dollars in acquisitions. How big is this business? So it's a significant amount of acquisitions, you know, that's, you know, 25% of the inter- or you know, 20% of the enterprise value, 25% of the market cap in acquisitions over the course of this time period. Um, PPE has gone up a decent amount. Inventory is coming up a decent amount. That's driven a lot. When do these acquisitions hit? Let's check. Yeah, big acquisitions here, 2021. A lot of acquisitions here in these last few years. And what that's doing is that's really driving this decline in return on invested capital. Because they're investing so much money in acquisitions and it's not increasing the earnings, you're going to have a decline in capital. Something to be aware of. They're probably overpaying on acquisitions is what I would assess that as in terms of you're not really getting that same return that you've gotten in the past. Um, your long-term debt has gone up significantly. So, I mean, this is like a you know, 13x debt increase, 250 to 3.2 billion. But that's not really how I want to think about it here. It really came a lot in those last two years. I would think about it more is you've added basically $3 billion in debt to the business. Um, just in the last few years, you do have some cash that's offsetting it, which is why it only shows that net debt is not super high. Um, but we've not seen the returns yet from that investment. So I'm a little concerned that you'd take on that debt because you've not increased your business as rapidly as the debt has gone up. Cash flow. One of the things I want to check here is depreciation and amortization compared to my reinvestment rate. So you can see kind of at the beginning of the decade, 2013, 2015, these numbers are pretty similar. Then they started going above it. And what that did is that transitioned you from basically depreciating 130 million a year to 200 million a year by the end of the decade. And so you're reinvesting a lot of money into this depreciation. And what that's telling me is that my net income is probably overstating my true operating cash flow because I'm requiring to invest a lot in that business. Now, it's hard to tell because this is not broken out by growth versus non-growth investments, but clearly you're not getting super, super high returns on those investments because you've been growing your assets faster. Um, and you've also been putting a lot of money in acquisitions, a lot of money, especially in 2021. Of course, that's where most of the debt came from as well. I don't know. I mean, so here's the thing. Hormel Foods has a lot of things that are very attractive about it. 20 straight years of profits is always something that gets my eye, something that is attractive. Um, Makes it a high-quality business. You're hitting all those metrics for high-quality businesses. I like putting high-quality businesses on my watch list. Hormel Foods is not going to go on my watch list. Why? Why? It's mainly this gap here. Revenue is growing slower than assets and revenue is growing at 4%. If revenue is growing at 7% or 8% or higher, this would be a lot more attractive to me. I would have a clear path to get to my double digit returns. Right now, I don't see a clear path to double digit returns with hormone foods unless the future is substantially better than the past and that is not something I like to bet on. So for me, I'm going to pass on hormone foods. I do think it's a high quality business. I do think it's earning attractive high returns on capital. It is able to reinvest some of that money but it's not able to reinvest enough to hit towards my watch list level of quality. So thank you for listening. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth, like button, subscribe. And if you want to check out quickfs.net, use my affiliate link. First link in the description below. I can get a commission if you use my link to get a free or paid account. Consider doing that to support the channel.